encounters with creatures thought to only exist in myths and legends. Experience captivating first-hand accounts of dragons, werewolves, sea monsters, colossal insects, enormous eagles, oversized amphibians, mermaids, and perhaps more. Hi, I'm Dr. Rita Louise and this is Just Energy. In this episode, we'll be speaking with cryptozoologist Ken Gearhart, who claims that there have been sightings of odd creatures around the globe. From Europe to Australia to the Americas and back, these creatures seem to be everywhere but nowhere. It's time to dig into the truth behind these elusive, mysterious beasts. Ken Gearhart is a widely recognized cryptozoologist and field investigator for the Center of Freudian Zoology, as well as a fellow of the Pangaea Institute. He has traveled the world searching for evidence of mysterious animals and legendary beasts, including Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, the Chupacabra, enigmatic winged creatures, and werewolves. In addition to co-hosting History Channel TV series Missing in Alaska, Ken has appeared on television series including Monster Quest and is featured in the History Channel special The Real Werewolf as well as a number of other television series that feature strange creatures. His webpage is KenGearhart.com, so please welcome Ken Gearhart. Ken, it is so good to have you come back on. I am so glad you have a new book out, The Menagerie of Mysterious Beasts. You know, and I just remember talking to you about your last book that had to do with, you know, cryptoids from mythology, which Mm -hmm. was a really fascinating conversation that we had here on Just Energy Radio. Um, You know, so we've kind of done the bio part in earlier interviews. So if somebody wants to learn more about you, they should just search on the site and they can get to those episodes. But why write this book? What, what, What caused you to attack the cryptozoology question from yet another angle. Well, Rita, long before cryptozoology, the word cryptozoology was around, it was known as romantic zoology back in the late 19th and early 20th century. And many of my heroes, the the pioneers, if you will, that were uh, interested in this quote-unquote romantic zoology, I would love some, I, I love some of those books. I have a nice collection of these really old books. And um, this is kind of an homage to those early styles of books because it's a little bit whimsical and there's a broad range of topics. It's not just about one cryptid like a Bigfoot or or Big Birds or whatever, but it covers a whole range of things that I've investigated through the years and uh, some of my adventures and travels around the world. And moreover, it has a a good amount of never-before-published first-hand eyewitness accounts because as you can imagine a lot of people get in touch with me and say hey I saw this thing I you know I don't know what it was and um, you know these are some of the more credible ones where I really interviewed people got to know them and felt like wow there's something here this is really cool you know and I, I didn't mean to laugh while you were talking about you know romantic cryptozoology or whatever but I'm thinking you know like you know, a hot date with a Bigfoot. I mean, that that was what came to mind. And I'm like, no, I know that's not what he means, but that's what came to mind. <laughs> but in, in reading your book, sorry, <laughs> but in reading your book, this is something I never knew about you, that you actually had a firsthand personal encounter with a mysterious creature when you were a kid. You know, so what happened? Um. Oh, you're talking about the Minnesota Iceman, of course. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, yeah, that throws me because it's, it's, it wasn't walking or running. It was basically laying um, very still in a giant block of ice. And um, it's the story. This is basically known as the Minnesota Iceman. I grew up in Minnesota for my early years. And in 1976, I was at the, the state fair, and I heard this barker talking about a, a man-like creature frozen in a block of ice and come check it out. So I went up 
uh, into this exhibit. And yeah, they, you look down into this, it was like a big sarcophagus or coffin with this block of ice. And inside of that was this prehistoric looking hairy caveman creature. And um, uh, it was pretty scary and weird. And, uh, but it's actually very famous in the field of cryptozoology because this, back in the late 60s, this Iceman was investigated by two cryptozoologists who, they weren't able to touch it. I mean, it was, it's in a block of ice, so they had to kind of do the best they could. But uh, they came away convinced that it was a real flesh and blood thing. And maybe a, ne a surviving Neanderthal man that lived into recent times or a Bigfoot, you know, a juvenile Bigfoot. And, um, but, the, you know, then there was a whole controversy surrounding it as word got out. And um, the, the guy that owned the thing actually um, claimed that he put it into hiding. And then he made, a, made a, uh, a model, a latex version of it that he started to tour with. And so now it's kind of like, was, you know, was it a, a kind of a shell game where he had a real animal and then replaced it with something else because he was nervous about it? Or you know, was the whole thing a, a giant hoax and was it just a big stuffed dummy the whole time and these two cryptozoologists were taken in. Um, it's a great story. Well, as you think back on it now, you know, and I know that it was a long time ago, but with your, you know, your eye that you have for looking for these kind of creatures, what would be your assessment of what you saw as a kid? Well, what I saw in 1976 was largely believed to be the latex version, the dummy, the model. And um, interestingly enough, it surfaced, the Minnesota Iceman uh, disappeared for many years, but it surfaced a few years ago and was actually purchased by a guy in Austin, Texas, Steve Boosty at Museum of the Weird. And he's got this thing on display at this museum of, of oddities, so people can go look at it. Uh, well, when he purchased this exhibit, um, I went and examined it, and um, yeah, I felt it was the same thing I saw when I was a kid, and it probably is a latex dummy, that version is, because, well, you can tell, you know, but <laughs> you look at it carefully. <laughs> but uh, perhaps there was something more substantial to this version back in the late 60s. Maybe that was a missing link of some kind, and uh, if so, the guy that owned it, Frank Hansen, Nobody knows what he did with the body. He passed away years ago. Maybe he buried it out in his backyard, or uh, you know, maybe there's something out there to be discovered. So is that what is that one of the events that happened to you that kind of led you into the whole concept of becoming a cryptozoologist and studying these kind of creatures? Oh, absolutely. I mean, just prior to that, I had uh, caught a TV show about Bigfoot. And there was also, a, I, I don't know if In Search Of was on yet, but I was a big fan of a show called In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy, and they would do, so I was already interested in Bigfoot, had read a lot of books at the library and stuff, and but I'd never heard of this thing. And so, you know, it, it kind of creeped me out a little bit and made me think, wow, maybe, you know, maybe there's more to this. Maybe it's not just a legend. But that's kind of cool, you know, um, very cool. Speaking of Bigfoot, um, you know, there's been stories of DNA testing that's been done on mm -hmm. Bigfoot and, you know, I've seen posts on Facebook that there have been some results that have come forward. And do you have any information on that? And can you speak on that whole thing for a second? Um, well, yeah, there have been some allegations of quote unquote Bigfoot DNA. Uh, most notably, there is a woman here in Texas, a scientist named Melba Ketchum, who's a veterinarian and um, uh, does DNA genetic work as well and several years ago she came out with a claim that she had taken in several samples from people of hairs and different things that they had found that were presumed to belong to a Bigfoot and she had tested them and actually had mapped the genome of this Bigfoot Sasquatch creature so that was uh, creating quite a buzz there for a while. Um, unfortunately um, things haven't really gone well as far as that goes. The information was released on social media, which is not really a scientific way to go out there with a groundbreaking discovery. If there are proper channels in the scientific field to release that information, to have it peer reviewed, you know, you publish it in a proper journal and so forth if it's, if it's that important. And then the most recent thing I've heard is was three years ago, 2013, they were supposed to finally come out with this grand paper that explained everything and the and so it's been three years and nothing's happening. So it's one of those things that's kind of strange. Like, um, you know, I think the longer, sadly, the longer time goes on, the more that 
many of us in the field are reluctant to accept this as valid. Now, there's one other interesting development. There's a professor at Oxford University in England, a guy named Brian Sykes, who has been openly accepting alleged evidence for Bigfoot and the Yeti of the, of the Himalayas, and he's been testing hairs and different things that people are bringing to him, and also done some field work, but um, uh, all of the hairs that he's tested so far have either turned out to be bears or um, other animals, and some of them, in fact, did have human DNA, but those may have been contaminated because it's very difficult to collect DNA evidence out in the wilderness without contaminating it and, and you know, and so it's, it's a kind of a, a sticky wicket, but uh, it gives us hope that maybe at some point someone will bring in something definitive. Mm-hmm. Well, and now the whole thing with, you know, hearing that they were going to release the DNA evidence, you know, sometime a couple of years ago, and then it just fizzling into nothing, that answers my question about that, because I was like, okay, you know, and I tried to get Melba onto the show because she doesn't, she lives about 30 miles from me, so really close, mm -hmm. but she declined. Even though this would be like a very friendly forum and I wouldn't attack her or poo-poo what she would have to say, but she declined. Yeah. And I've never met Melba Ketchum, I and mean, I don't want to seem like I'm casting judgment here, but she has done some, made some declarations. She's been very focused on merchandising over the past few years. I'm going to make a movie, so a Kickstarter campaign, and now I'm going to make a line of Sasquatch clothing and a kid's book and all these things. And it seems like if you're a scientist, why are you trying to find all these avenues to, to you know, to commercialize your, your research? And she's also made an allegation that she's witnessed a dog man, which is uh, another strange creature, but what are the odds of a, a Bigfoot research scientist having a dogman sighting? So, I don't know. I, I, you know, I have problems with it, but I'd love to see the, the paper or whatever when it comes out. Yeah, I mean, because she was supposed to also do work with the elongated skull material and I think star child skull material and that kind of didn't go anywhere either, mm. which is sad. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and sad. I don't know if it has anything to do with her or if it has to do with the lab or, you know, I, I, I don't know and I'm not even going to speculate in one way or another, you know, it's just is where it's at right now. Well, one last thing and um, I haven't read the, uh, I haven't read about it in a while so I may not have this 100% right, but the, the, the claim as far as this Bigfoot sea Sasquatch DNA was that it indicated a hybrid between an unknown human ancestor, a hominoid, and um, something else that was very strange. So it just didn't, you know, and I certainly don't pretend to be a, an anthropologist or, uh, you know, a PhD, but um, it just didn't seem very viable in terms of what the explanation was as far as what Bigfoot or Sasquatch might be. Mm hmm Interesting. So, you know, we're talking about Bigfoot and, you know, Bigfoot sightings. But are there any other hominid creatures that wander around in the woods or in places unknown that we don't know about or doesn't really get as much attention as Bigfoot? Oh yeah, there are some and uh, I'm privy to many of those. There are a lot of local or regional names for Bigfoot or Sasquatch. So you go to a certain little small town in uh, Mississippi, it's known as the Barden Booger, you know, for example. So you get these little colorful names, but they, the descriptions are always a Bigfoot, a big hairy man-like thing running around. Um, in my book, I cover a one interesting one known as the White Bluff Screamer. And uh, these reports emanate from central Tennessee, just outside of Nashville, some, some uh, hills and hollers out there, very forested. And um, people describe this creature as being very large and uh, shaggy and hairy and having a long neck and um, also being white in color. Now there are sightings or reports of white or silver Bigfoots or Sasquatches, but those are very rare. Um, obviously all animals can have an albino phase or a, a loose kistic phase where they're, you know, they don't have any pigmentation or coloration, they're white. But uh, one lady reached out to me and she and another friend were camping out here in this area of central Tennessee one time and um, suddenly they heard something moving through their camp and when they turned on some uh, the headlights on their car which was parked nearby they saw these giant white creatures kind of she said they were kind of dirty looking but they, they had white fur and they kind of scurried into the brush very quickly 
And she said these things were extremely tall and powerful looking. So um, in doing some research on that area, I found that there have been actually sightings of Bigfoot in that area. And also one motorist described seeing a white colored Bigfoot running across from his car. So um, you might have kind of a regional version of a Bigfoot or Sasquatch. And for whatever reason, maybe it's genetic uh, reasons that, you know, they're all white colored or silver colored. Uh, or as I'm using my book, you know, maybe it's a retirement home for older Bigfoots or Sasquatches because as we know, uh, most of us hominoids, when we get older, our hair turns kind of white, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they just need a good hairdresser, that's it. That's it, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting, and I don't know if it's because just about every cryptozoologist I know all live basically in Texas, but it seems like there's been so much more coverage of what's happening in the southern region where, you know, I think Bigfoot, the American version of Bigfoot, started up in the Pacific Northwest, and it yep. doesn't sound like there's as much reporting going on in that area, you know, or I'm not, he or I'm not hearing about it. Well, I think that's the case because I just actually got back from Washington State yesterday. I was up there for the International Bigfoot Conference and I had an opportunity to commune with many of the top researchers up in Washington State, Oregon, Northern California and so forth. Um, I don't often get to do that because I typically work with guys here in the South uh, and some you know guys up in the Midwest and stuff. But uh, yeah, there is a lot of activity still in California, Washington, Oregon. Uh, by far the largest percentage of Bigfoot sightings, and traditionally that's always been the case. Um, many Native American legends up there and so forth, and there's some evidence being found. They're finding nests and some really good tracks and um, not a lot of good photographic evidence, nothing really convincing yet. Um, so yeah, Bigfoot or Sasquatch seems to be a global phenomenon, has different names all over the world. Um, but I think the highest concentration in North America is by far in those Pacific ranges like the Cascades. And not here. Hmm. They have more trees. so it's... We, we have, you know, we have a fair amount of sightings here. Yeah. Isn't it? Um, the four corner area, you know, when you're looking at Northwest Arkansas, Northeast Texas, Southeast Oklahoma, Southwest, I'm sorry, it was Northwest Louisiana, Northeast Texas, you know, Arkansas, that, that whole area traditionally, a lot of sightings. And many of the researchers in the field today were very influenced by a movie called The Legend of Boggy Creek, which came out in the early 70s, and it was about a Bigfoot in uh, terrorizing a small town called Falk, Arkansas. Now, they didn't ever mention the name Bigfoot in that movie, but it was obvious that's what it was. And uh, there are still a lot of sightings up in that region. But that's pretty cool. In the Pacific Northwest, do they have reportings of these albino-like Bigfoots mm -hmm. also? There have been some, yeah. And um, even one here in North Texas uh, known as the Lake Worth Monster. Uh, actually, up in your neck of the woods, just outside of Fort Worth there, Lake Worth, Goat Man or, or Monster was described as being white. So, yeah, those have come up from time to time. When we're talking about these creatures, and this is kind of a off-topic question, kind of, um, do you think that people that are seeing them are seeing kind of the same creatures, you know, like maybe a small pocket of creatures that are in the area? Or do you think that there's a fair sized population so that it's not just a repeat of the same creature all the time? Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. It's a great question. Well, there obviously has to be a viable. Well, there obviously has to be a viable breeding population, and that holds true for any animal species. Uh, you have to have genetic diversity in order to maintain a healthy stock, if you will. So what is a healthy population of, of Bigfoot or Sasquatches? We don't really know, but I do think they're very rare. So they're obviously not endangered, um, or maybe they are right on the edge of being endangered, but you know. So there have been kind of speculations that maybe there's a, a, you know, a couple to a few thousand of these things in North America. It sounds like a lot, but when you think of how big North America is and you spread them out, you know, um, maybe not so much. So um, I think that you have pockets in certain areas that are probably higher populations. And then I think, for example, here in the southeastern United States, you probably have some rain, uh, 
roving nomadic Bigfoots, maybe even small families, but they're very cut off. You know, they're in little pockets of wilderness that are surrounded by highways and bridges and dams and things like that. And that could be creating genetic problems. There could be inbreeding going on. Just speculating here, there could be inbreeding going on, which leads to strange looking footprints with missing toes or uh, in some cases maybe a more aggressive behavior pattern, things like that. Um, but you know, we really don't know. Uh, but these things are definitely out there because I get sightings from credible people all over the place. Do you think that there were, and I'm going to say more sightings or a, a large body of uh, evidence, you know, oral tradition, myth, whatever, prior to, you know, us coming here and colonizing and really kind of taking over this land when it was just much more open space when the Native Americans were here? Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, you know, many Native American legends from all over North America um, different names, but of course in the Pacific Northwest you have the Sasquatch, Oma, Skookum, Bakwas, the Zanakwa. When I was up in Alaska last year filming, uh, there were descriptions of Bigfoot. They call them hairy man, Bigfoot type things from many different tribes. Uh, the Arul attack, the Uruyuli, the Gilya, Kushtika, uh, and so forth. So th there, are, the fact that they're so they so prevalent in Native American legends all over North America to me indicates that there probably were a lot more than at one time. There was obviously more wilderness, you know, back then, more uh, habitat. And, um, you know, there are, there are some interesting Native legends about, you know, groups of these Bigfoot or Sasquatch creatures, even an allegation or a story of, a, of an actual war between a, an Indian tribe in Northern California and a whole uh, clan of Sasquatches, is kind of a territorial dispute and things like that. So, but that's cool. You know, and one of the things that I look for, you know, because I like really looking at the mythology and stuff, is the commonality of stories that you find between unrelated groups. You know, so if you have a group in Alaska, and you have a group in the Pacific Northwest, and you have a group in, you know, the Texas Oklahoma area. Then you have, you know, what's going on in China, you know, and these very unrelated pockets all talking about basically the same thing says to me that there has to be something going on that's not just a fairy tale. Not that we no. know, but... No, it's, to me, that's very compelling, too. When you look at the global mythologies, the Yeti, the Yeren of China, the Mande Burung of India, the Almasti of Russia, I mean there's so many and the descriptions have always been very similar, basically giant powerful hairy giants that look man-like um, but have, you know, uh, kind of ape-like features as well, primitive features. Um, you know, it's just one of the layers of Bigfooters, one of the layers of evidence and you know, then you add on thousands of eyewitness, modern eyewitness reports that are probably just scraping the surface since most people don't ever talk about their sightings, let's face it, they keep this uh, under wraps. Well, they have to look up from their phones, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I hear that all the time where people will come up to me at a Bigfoot conference or, or at an event and they hear about Bigfoot and they're like, well, you know, never really told anyone this, but, you know, my uncle was hunting and whatever, but, um, and yeah, and then you have some physical evidence. Let me try to do a visual thing here. Hold on. You have some physical evidence, like these castings of footprints, which are actually, these have been studied by anthropologists and it's not just a human foot that's enlarged it's it's actually a redesigned leverage with a missing arch uh, two bulges one on each side smaller toes in proportion of you know huge heel and this is exactly what you would need to support the weight of a 600 pound upright walking hominid <laughs> and you know you have a consistent model or archetype as far as these tracks that have been found a lot of them in remote areas and but also you, there's a degree of variation, including crippled individuals with club foot, different sizes, slightly different characteristics that would indicate a perfectly natural variation within a species. And then of course you have the Patterson Gimlin film, which pretty much everyone has seen, and it's kind of an intriguing piece of footage. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I remember seeing that when it first came out. I was like, Whoa. <laughs> yeah, I've watched it hundreds of times, and very recently, uh, some uh, digitized, um, stabilized versions on a giant forty-inch high-definition flat screen, and it's like you can see detail in there that that makes you really think, man, that's not a costume, you know. I'm just, I'm looking at muscles flexing. I'm seeing a very natural look, even the breasts. Sorry to bring up breasts on the daytime show, but uh, the Patterson film subject we assume is a female Bigfoot because she has these pendulous breasts. And when she turns and looks back at the camera and turns back again, that looks natural, you know. And it's like, how are you going to fake something like that back in 1967? Yeah, you can't. And I'm just letting everyone know it wasn't my dad. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, but <laughs> my cousins used to call my dad Bigfoot. Not to his really? face. Okay. Yeah, he was Big not guy? a tall man, but he was a a hairy man. <laughs> oh, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to change topics here on you. You know, but in your book, A Menagerie of Mysterious Beasts, you talk about werewolves. Can werewolves? <laughs> I know. It's, it sounds a little bit out there. It's true. But historically, of course, there are legends of werewolf creatures around the world. Um, not, you know, not the traditional Hollywood version of the wolf man where it's basically a man with a with a snout stuff, but typically more like a giant wolf um, with, you know, very ferocious characteristics. Sometimes they walk upright, but more often they're down on all four legs. Um, but I investigated a fair, famous case in France, for example, back in 2009 and 10, something known as the La Bête du Gévaudan, the Beast of Gévaudan, which was a described as a wolf, looking like a wolf, but much larger and somewhat different. And it may have killed anywhere from 60 to 100, over 100 people in southern France. And there, this is well documented in different death archives and historical records. King Louis XV became involved and sent wolf hunters and soldiers out to try to dispatch this thing because it was creating mass hysteria, as you can imagine. And so it's a fascinating story. And ultimately, there was an animal that was shot. Um, by a gentleman and um, with silver bullets, interestingly enough. So, um, <laughs> but you know, there's some controversy surrounding the body of this thing, and, and you know what really happened. Now, uh, more recently, there are sightings of something called the Dog Man, which basically is like a werewolf, and those sightings have emanated from all over the Midwestern United States. Well documented by my colleague Linda Godfrey from Wisconsin. Most of the sightings from Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio. Kentucky and Pennsylvania, but still sightings all over. Um, the descriptions don't really jive with anything in the natural world, anything in the fossil history. So then we're left to wonder what are these things? In my own opinion, I, I think that they have physical characteristics, but they're not naturally evolved on this planet. I think they're probably something more supernatural in nature. Um, but it's pretty weird stuff. Well, and that was kind of going to be my follow-up question about the werewolves, especially what you were talking about in France. Um, I just had uh, Erica Lukes on, who does work around the Skinwalker Ranch. And one of the things she was talking about were these oversized wolves that will show up and kind of have these weird characteristics and red mm. eyes. And, mm. and I'm wondering if there might be a correlation even between those. I mean, not that you necessarily know, but it did, you know, those little wheels started turning that sure. that might be part of the explanation. Could be. I mean, there's certainly, um, in my field, there are um, very different ways to look at things, but often these things that I investigate, these cryptids, I feel are cases of composite identity, meaning that there are several different factors involved. There may be an actual mystery creature at the root of it all. But then you also have misidentifications of known animals. In the case of the werewolves, maybe just giant wolves or weird-looking bears, things like that. Uh, then you have people that just plain out, plain make up stories for whatever reason. Some of them are a little bit delusional, or maybe they're trying to profit and get attention, make money off the situation. So you have to look at all those kinds of different factors. But um, you know, again, with the, with the wolf man, the dog man. I've been getting a lot of recent reports from South America. I have a contacts down there that are sending me reports. Uh, I've heard of sightings in Australia, um, you know, all over North America. So whatever it is, it's a phenomenon that's wide-reaching. 
That's Ken Gearhart. His webpage is kengearhart.com. His book, The Menagerie of Mysterious Beasts. And thank you for watching this portion of our interview today with Ken. If you're enjoying today's program, please click on the button below and subscribe to our channel. If you want to hear this interview in its entirety, become a Just Energy Radio Insider at JustEnergyRadio.com and access full shows commercial free and over nine years of show archives. And don't forget to share this episode with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So until next time, I'm Dr. Rita Louise. This is Just Energy. Be blessed.